crashed a vehicle? It's not repentance time. You don't need to tell anybody. Not confession time. But have you ever crashed your vehicle? Have you ever crashed a car? You know, and, and you know, in Australia, I'm going to show you a picture of the outback of Australia, the, the highway. Look at this. This is so difficult to crash a car on that highway. But it is amazing how many times people run into things. That you don't see any trees. You don't see any fences. But you do see one sign. They probably put that sign up hundreds of times because it's the only thing that's sticking up out there. You know, if there's a tree, they say, and this is truth for the outback. They say there's a tree in the middle of the field. The tree will get hit by a car every single time. It goes off the road. It will go towards a tree and it'll hit the tree. Why didn't they miss the tree? Because they're looking at the tree. It's the only thing sticking up. And we don't understand this, but when we're driving, we, pre we predominantly go to where our eyes, our eyes, it's not our hands. You think your hands are leading, but it's your eyes. You go, keep, your, keep your eyes on the road. They, they always tell you that. Keep your eyes on the road. You start wandering with your eyes in driving class. The guy next to you in the car puts his foot on the brake. Anybody been to driving school and they had in their car? The guy gets nervous when you start looking around because he knows where your eyes go. That's where your hands and the wheel will go. And that's what happens in the outback. The trees have got dints in them. <laughs> the signs, they have to keep putting them up. The fence post, you have one fence post there. That thing is going to get hit a hundred times. Why? Because that's, that's human nature. That's the way it is. And it's not easy to retrain yourself. I even hit a, I hit a tree when I went out there. And it was, it was a few trees. It was not quite as sparse as that. There are a few trees. And I took a corner a little fast. This is my confession time. Took a full corner, got off the road. And, and I looked at the tree and hit the tree. And then when I did the police report and all that for my insurance. And, and you know, I found out that if I had looked at the gap, there's two trees, there's three trees, there's a gap. If you look at the gap, you go through the gap and you miss the trees. Why didn't you tell me that before? Well, they probably did in driver's school, but I didn't listen. <laughs> so now you are in church today. Life comes around us. There's things speaking to us. There's problems, circumstances, issues, things in our partner. My partner's perfect, beautiful, because that's what I choose to see. And I'm perfect because she chooses to see my perfections. My, my mistakes, you know, gloss over them. Love covers a multitude of sins. And so, <laughs> well, we look at this, as the Bible says. And so, but if, if you guys and I, if we see problems, all we see is problems, we'll gravitate towards them. Because you move in the direction of the predominant vision that you see. And so as we revision or refocus or see things from another perspective, which we talked about all last year, was looking at it from a different perspective. So we're looking today and we're, we're talking about an open door for this whole year. We see it says in uh, Revelation 3.8, I've opened a door before you that no one can slam shut. God's speaking to John in the book of Revelation saying there's an opportunity. There's an open door I'm giving you. And so we're hearing that for ourselves. God's got, got something for us. Everyone's like, oh, that's good news. There's something for us. <laughs> so what is it? Well, we're ready for opportunities that God is sending our way. And we're talking about refocusing for good so that we do see the goodness and the good things coming and the good in our partner and the good in the people around us. Because the predominant vision that we have is the direction we'll go. And we'll start to speak to that. Oh my gosh, you look so good today. You got up on, you, got, you just look so nice when you got out of bed. And I brought you that cup of tea and you drank it. It was just lovely. And you gave me the cup. And I felt it was like an honor and a joy to bring it down to the kitchen after I'd brought you the cup. And all these, look at it from the, always look on the bright side of life. Have you seen that? The life of Brian and they're hanging on the cross. Always look on the bright side. Well, <laughs> they're hanging on a cross. How bright can it get? <laughs> Well, let's just get back into the message. I'm getting, getting off track here. Focus, Stephen. How do we get ready? How do, how do we get ready to walk through the door? The opportunities of good that God's bringing our way. Everybody say focus. Focus is important. It's imperative. So we focus for the journey. The definition of the word focus is this. To pay particular attention to. To avoid distractions. There are deadly distractions. We don't want to hit a tree. We don't want to hit a fence post. We don't want to hit a sign. We don't want to hit the ditch. We want to look in the positive, perfect direction that we're meant to go. Look into God's wonderful truth and love and all the good things he has in store. And our lives will eventually go in that direction. So Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, We must focus on Jesus, the source and goal of our faith. Our faith is simply believing. Little children are so wonderful. You tell them something and they believe you. 
You tell them something and they say, really? What is it? And they ask a hundred million questions. And you say this. And you say, why is the sky blue? Because God doesn't like yellow. Oh, really? I'm, <laughs> I don't know. You make it up. They believe you. You don't make it up. I'm being silly. Don't, don't. But because there's no reason. Do you know children are not reasonable? You know, when you're in an argument with your, with your husband and he's, he's acting like a child, it's not reasonable. Because I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. Okay. Don't get silent on me. But the children are not reasonable because they don't function in the realm of reason. They function without even meaning to. They function in belief and in faith. Do you know what reason is? Reason is simply weighing up with every, everything we've been through in life, our feelings, our emotions, our perceptions, everything that's happened to us, and it forms a memory bank in our life, and we rely on that now. That's called reason. Where a lot of it, our perceptions, or what I think you're thinking of me, you probably think I'm crazy. But whatever, I think you love me. I think you love me. I think you think I'm good. So I have no problems. So whatever your perceptions are, right or wrong, they, they, they're cultivating your reasonable experience on life. Now, God has thoughts that are higher than ours. He's got ways that are better. He's got things he wants to do that seem impossible to us, like healing, having a child, having a pretty wife, having a great life, being six foot two and brown skin. It hasn't worked for me yet. I'm still praying. I'm joking. I'm joking. No, I don't need to. She likes a little short Aussie. Okay. <laughs> And we look at this. And so look unto Jesus. That's why it says, this is the simplest message you'll ever get in church. Look unto Jesus. Simplest but the most powerful. The word there, look, in the original Greek, the word means uh, to be away, look away from or to see. The word signifies undivided attention, looking away from all distractions in order to fix one's gaze on one object. And in this particular verse, Hebrews 12, 2, is having eyes for no one but Jesus. If, if we can live our life with the simplicity of, of knowing he loves me and he's looking at me and he's pleased with me and Jesus is good, then our lives go in the direction of that. So pay attention fully to Jesus. Be distracted by Jesus. There's times he'll distract you out of an argument. He'll distract you out of a dumb decision. He'll distract you off the path of, of craziness, corruption, terror, you know, problems by simply arresting our hearts and taking over in love. And I encourage you, maybe even on March 8th, come along to the worship night, 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. We're going to take just one hour and we're going to worship Jesus for one hour. The last time we had it, we had some great stories. Who loved it? Who thought it was amazing? Who came along? Oh, my gosh. I was just worshiping and I was enjoying this. And we're going to do that again, March 8th. You're all welcome. And so you get your eyes on Jesus and life turns around. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. That word finisher means perfecter. You know, we come into the kingdom of God through faith. I'll get into that in a moment. But where we, where we focus our eyes is where we're going to be led. Have a look at the board, the, the screen there. I want to show you a picture of a tree. This photo was taken in 1961. That tree is called the tree of Tenere. That tree of Tenere is in the middle of the, used to be in the middle of the Sahara Desert, right in the middle. And for 150 kilometers all around from that tree outwards, there's no other trees. And that tree had been there for 300 years. And there's a massive deep well there, and that tree was growing happily for 300 years, and it was a landmark that travelers used to get their bearings straight to come back on track. And if they were lost, they could see that tree from miles away. They'd go to the tree, they'd get their bearings and go in the right direction. Well, there was a truck driver in 1973 going through the desert, and for some reason he looked at the tree, and he drove over the tree and killed the tree. <laughs> Cut the thing off. Destroyed the tree. They had, it was such a wonderful historic landmark. They took the root system and the trunk and they put it in a museum. And then they stuck a big metal tree there just to, as, a, as an honor to the old tree that was there before. But why did he hit that tree? They surmised that he was drunk. Well, there's possibly he could have had some alcohol in his system. He was tired. Now, I simply think he saw a tree. He was driving towards it. Maybe he started nodding off, opened his eyes, and he, all he saw was a tree. And where he's looking, the, the tree gravitated. He gravitated towards it. Boom. No more tree. So no more problem. Nobody else has taken off. No, I'm joking. But this is life. 
if we will, that, that happened, look, it happens in Australia, it happened in the Sahara Desert once, <laughs> never again, <laughs> it won't happen again, but this is what's happening in our lives, and if we focus on, on his goodness, let's look at John 10, 7, then Jesus said to them again, he's talking to us today, while I was preparing this message, I believe he was giving me verses to share with you amongst the silliness. But he, he, I believe he was wanting to talk to our hearts. Then Jesus said to them again. He's talking to us again. Most, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. So we've been spoken to this year that there's a door open to us, everyone. And now we're hearing today that he is that door. And what are we meant to do? We're meant to look at the doorway to go through the doorway. Let's look at Jesus. He's the door. As you open your eyes up and see Jesus in your life, as you as a believer starts to focus more on Jesus, look at him in the Bible, look at him in the New Testament, look at get your heart and hopes. My wife's going to talk about it in a moment. As we do this more and more, our lives will wind upward and come into his perfect will. Such a simple message, but there's a door open of opportunity for every one of us. And what he's saying is, I am the door. Look to me and I'll take you through. So your life will go in that direction and you will have God's goodness in your life. So as we finish up today, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We come to God through seeing Jesus. We come to truth through seeing Jesus. We come into abundant life now and for eternity through seeing Jesus. I can't wait to go to heaven. My goodness, heaven's going to be the best. There's food in heaven. Yeah, they said for the first, however long we have a wedding banquet, there's food at a banquet. There's angels that are going to be serving us. I believe, I've, I've visualized that. I'm like, <laughs> you give me a little bit of this one over here. Because it doesn't one work one at home. Oh my gosh, this one tastes <laughs> <laughs> You've got to visualize it because it doesn't quite work like that at home. I don't do that at home. That's right. I don't do that at home. <laughs> but I can do that and I open up and then. I think to myself, this is going to be the most amazing thing when we get to have heaven. But you know what's better? Having heaven on earth before we get there. If we look to Jesus and we open our heart, we draw heaven to earth. The reason you're still on this planet as a believer and God hasn't taken you to heaven is because our role now is to bring heaven to earth and express it to all the other humans so that they know we don't follow a religion, we don't have all this chaos, we follow a loving God who really cares about the humans. Come on, let's praise him for a moment. Jesus, you're awesome. We want to keep our eyes on you. We want to go through the door. You're the door. You're the way, the truth, and the life, and we want to know you more. Dr. Carmen has some announcements, and then she's going to share with us how each one of our lives can go better and better as we focus. She's going to show us how to do that. God bless you guys today. Fantastic. We're going to have our time of giving right now for a moment. You can use the app to give. Of course, you can text to give. But if you need an envelope for your giving today, our hosts are going to bring that envelope to you. And we're going to look at the Bible for just a few moments to inspire our giving. We've been studying Isaiah chapter 32, verse 8 together. It says, but generous people plan to do what is generous. And they stand firm in their generosity. Today, I'm going to look at that one small word, what. The definition of that word, what, means a true nature or identity of something. And so have you ever kind of given the thought and thought, what am I doing? Have you ever just thought about that in life? Like, what am I doing, right? And, and it, we give that thought thought. We give that, that thought to something of like, what's going on? What am I doing? And we really have to do that when it comes to our giving too. It says, but generous people plan to do what is generous. So we ask ourselves the questions, what am I doing? Am I honoring God this month? Am I putting into practice what the word of God says? Am I focused on the right things when it comes to my finances and honoring God with my giving? When we look at what am I doing? We are inspired to step forward in generosity to function under the principles of the word of God that take us forward. And so today I want to pray God's blessing over you as we just take the time to say, what am I doing? Am I focused in the right direction? Am I honoring God today? And as we do that, we're going to believe God for his blessing to touch you today. So let's pray over our giving today. God, we just thank you for your word that inspires us to move forward into generosity. God, today we return the tithe, that first 10%. And as we do that, God, we thank you that the windows of heaven, they are open over the tithers of great church in Jesus' name.
God, as we present our offerings to you today, God, as we're generous, as we step forward in our generosity, we thank you, God, as we evaluate what am I doing with my giving? What am I doing as I honor the word of God with my giving? We thank you, God, that as we give today, God, it will come back to us in a greater measure. God, you will increase us more and more, us, our children, our children's children. God, you will open doors. God, you will favor us. God, as we honor you with our finances, God, you will make a greater way. And so, God, today, Today, as we give, we thank you for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you give today. So Pastor Steve was sharing with us about the open door and about us being able to be focused. I want you to turn to the person beside you and say, focus. Okay, focus in. We're going to focus in for a few moments. And, and I get to share with you today what develops your focus for the journey. We know that God has said there's a journey in front of us, that the door has been open. There's something greater on the other side. We are on the journey. But what develops our focus for the journey? The first one is having a focused heart. It's the core of who we are on the inside, our heart. And as, as our heart is focused in the right direction, it actually takes us forward. Psalm 86 verse 11 to 12 says, Teach me your way, O Lord, so that I may live in your truth. Focus my heart on fearing you. You know that word fearing you doesn't mean like cringing, like, oh, God's going to get me because I'm bad. Fearing you means to honor God, to stand in awe of God, to reverence God. So it says, focus my heart, focus my heart in the right position of reverence and honor and respect to you, God. It says, I will give thanks to you, God, with all my heart. Oh, Lord, my God, I will honor you forever. As we have this focused heart of reverence and awe before God, it actually moves us forward in the right direction. As we take our eyes off of everything else that could distract us and we, we allow our heart to be focused in on the one who made us, on the one who knows us, it actually takes us through the door that God has opened for us. Isaiah 26, verse 3 to 4 says, You will keep the peace, a perfect peace, for all who trust in you, and for those who dedicate their hearts and their minds to you. So trust the eternal one forever. He is like a great rock, strong, stable, trustworthy, lasting. You know, as we put our trust in God, as we dedicate our heart, as we focus our heart on God, is as we're able to see that God is strong. That God is stable. How many, how many are thankful that God is stable? <laughs> you know, we don't serve a God who's up and down and all around. He is strong. He is stable. He is trustworthy and lasting. Our focus, as we have a focused heart, it takes us in that direction. And really a focused heart comes from knowing what the word of God says about God what the word of God says about us, what the word of God says about our future. And so the word of God is what anchors our heart to be focused. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I won't sin against you. I've put your word on the inside of me. I've hidden the B-I-B-L-E. I've hidden your word in my heart so that when situations happen, in a week, in a month, in a year, in 10 years, whatever it might be, when I need the word of God, it is there hidden in my heart and I can bring it out and it will work for me. I've hidden it in my heart. And I remember being a new Christian and, and I had just started going to church and I was living in Australia and, and our church, it took us about four and a half hours to drive there one way. So it was a whole day event. We'd spend four and a half hours. How many know a church alive? It's worth the drive. Come on, a church alive is worth the drive. It is worth the drive. Four and a half hours to get there. Four and a half hours to get back, right? And so, but occasionally I had to work, and so I couldn't get to my church. And so there was a, a little community church that was there, and it was very traditional. And it, it, it wasn't something that I was going to, like, plant in, but it was somewhere I could go if I had to work on the weekend. And, and so I went there, and, and, uh, and they had their traditions, and that was good, but, but I, I needed something different. And so I was usually driving, but once in a while I went there. 
And the pastor was speaking this one message, and I actually still remember it. He said, you got to have the Bible. I was a new Christian. I didn't have the whole Bible yet. You know, I had some little promise books and some different things, but I didn't have the whole Bible. I said, you got to have the Bible. you got to get the Bible. you got to put the Bible in. And it was like everybody else was asleep in church, but I was listening to what he was saying. you got to have the Bible. you got to have the Bible. And I remember thinking there's only two places you can get the Bible, the church and a hotel room. <laughs> Those are only two places I'd never seen it, right? And so, so there's only two places you can get the Bible, the church or the hotel room. And I'm thinking, I don't plan on visiting a hotel room anytime soon. And so it's like the church. And so, you know, they have the pews and they have the Bibles in the pew. And he's like, you got to have the Bible. You got to have the Bible. I was like, just getting revved up. Everybody else is asleep, but I'm, I'm getting revved up. And, and something just came over me. And I grabbed the Bible out of the pew stuck it in my coat and ran out of the church building. I was like, I got to have the Bible. I got to have the Bible. So I get home. I'm like reading the Bible. I'm like, oh, this is good. Like, this is so good. I'm reading the Bible. And then, and then I had a small home group. And he said, when you go to the home group on the middle of the week, he said, I want you to bring your Bible with you. I thought, "Uh uh-oh, we got problem because when I bring this Bible out, it has the church name in big letters on the front. Like, they are going to know I stole this Bible. But he's like, you got to bring it, you know. You you, got to bring your Bible when you come. And I was kind of debating, do I leave it at home? Do I bring it? And finally, I thought, I just got to confess. I got to confess I stole the Bible. And so I go to this small group that Wednesday night, and I go to the small group, and I have my Bible kind of hidden, and then I bring it out. I'm like, I have to tell you. I stole the Bible on Sunday. You said you got to have the word. You know, I just grabbed it, put it in my coat, and I ran. He said, you know what? We cleaned the church after. We were dusting everything off. We were stacking the Bibles, and we noticed that one was missing. He said, we were so excited. He said, it is the first time in the history of this church that a Bible has ever been stolen. And he said, I was so excited. Somebody took the word. Somebody took the Bible, you know, so I didn't have to be a I just I carried that Bible everywhere I went, had the church name on it, just carried it everywhere. But I've hidden your word in my heart. We gotta have it. We gotta have it in our heart. Because we don't know what we're gonna face in a week. And we don't know what we're gonna face in a month. And we don't know what we're gonna face in three years. But if I have it hidden in my heart, I am ready for whatever I face. I have hidden your word in my heart. We need a focused heart, and that comes from having the word in our heart. What develops your focus for the journey? Number two is having focused thoughts. Philippians chapter four, verse eight says, in conclusion, brothers, focus your thoughts on what is true. You know, focus your thoughts on what is true. As long as you continue to focus your thoughts on a lie, you're going to be stagnant. You're going to be stuck in a rut. And, and, you know, there's lies that are around us of what, what we think people have said or what we think people have done or, or things we think of this or that. And we can have all these lies around our mind. But as long as we're focused on the lie, we're stuck in a rut. We've got to have our, our minds focused, our thoughts focused on what is true. And we find that through the word of God as well. We have to start focusing on what is true so we can move forward. The truth is you are loved. The truth is you're accepted. The truth is you are capable of change. The truth is you have a purpose on your life. God has a plan for your life. This is the truth that sets us free. So look back at that verse. It says, in conclusion, brothers, focus your thoughts on what is true, what is noble, righteous, pure, lovable, admirable, of some virtue or something praiseworthy. Are your thoughts focused on something that is praiseworthy? Do you allow your thoughts to go to that place where it's kind of like a boom, you know, mic drop, pause in the life. I got a reason to praise right now. Where you just break out in praise, where you break out in thanksgiving to God, where you you acknowledge, God, something good is happening in my life. Something good has happened in my life. Now, you might be surrounded by some difficulties. And you might be surrounded by some problems. But there's a reason to praise. Are your thoughts focused on what is praiseworthy? Are your thoughts focused on what you can do? Or are your thoughts focused on what you cannot do? 
Are your thoughts focused on, on what God's ability is in you to take you forward? Are your thoughts limited by there's nothing I can do? If we allow our thoughts to be focused in the right direction, praiseworthy, I, I can do it. Jesus said we can do all things through him, through him, through him, not on our own, through him, through him who strengthens us with an inner confidence. So you say, well, I, I, I can't pay off all my debts today. No, but you can take one extra shift and make one extra payment, and it'll take you forward. Well, I, 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 I can't lose all my weight today. No, but you can make some good, healthy eating choices today. You can go for a walk. You can exercise. Come on, it's going to take you forward. You know, I, I have a good friend here today, and, uh, you know, she went to the doctor. She was refused a transplant because of her health. And she can say, well, nothing I can do. Can't do nothing. No, she's up. We're praying in the prayer line. She's like, I'm going to lose some weight. I'm going to get healthy. I'm going to get myself in the place of opportunity. Come on, there's something we can do. Where are your thoughts focused? Are they on what you can't do? Are your thoughts focused on what you can do? God's ability inside of you. You can't fix all your problems today. But you can respond well emotionally. You can learn how to regulate yourself emotionally so you don't create some more unnecessary problems. Because how many know when we lose it, we just create some more problems, right? And so you can, you can learn how to regulate. You can learn how to respond instead of react so you don't create more unnecessary problems. We can focus our thoughts on what is good and what is right, and what is true, and what is praiseworthy. Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, be careful how you think, for your life is shaped by your thoughts. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. People are so worried about what everybody else thinks, but your life is not shaped by what everybody else thinks. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. It doesn't matter what they think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. So the word says, be careful how you think. For your life is shaped by your thoughts. So we have the ability to go through the open door if we focus our minds. If we focus our thoughts in the right direction. Number three, what develops your focus for the journey is having focused eyes. Come on, turn to the person beside you and say, look straight ahead. <laughs> look straight ahead. Proverbs 4, 25 to 27 says, keep your eyes focused on what is right. And look straight ahead to what is good. Don't turn off the road of goodness. You know, we were praying that even in the worship today. And you could just, you know feel the goodness of God just pouring over us as we worship together and, and coming under that. For surely your goodness and mercy is new every morning over my life. It says, keep your eyes focused on what is right. Look straight ahead to what is good. Don't turn off the road of goodness. If we're focused, on, if our eyes are focused on what is good, it's amazing how it will draw us forward. You know, if I'm focused on what is right and what is good in my spouse makes me say, come here, <laughs> right? It makes you, it draws that to you, right? If your eyes are focused on what is right and what is good in your career, something happens. You're like, I want to develop. I want to learn more. I want to advance. I want my skill set to get better. If your eyes are focused on, on what is right and what is good in your life, you begin to enjoy your life. You're like, whoa, like I'm enjoying my life. When our eyes are focused on what is good that God has already done in our life, we begin to realize he started it. He be began a good work in me, will not stop. He's going to take me forward. I'm going to cross over through the open door. Something greater is waiting for me. And so I want to encourage you to keep your eyes on what is good. Psalm 25 verse 15 says, if I keep my eyes on God, I won't trip over my own feet. If I keep my eyes on God, I won't trip myself up. You know, when, we, when we're not focused on what is good and what is healthy and what is, what is lovely, when we're not focused, we don't have our eyes in the right direction, 
we trip ourselves up. Have you ever heard it said, I'm my own worst enemy? You know, if our eyes are not focused on God, we trip ourselves up. We're, 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 we're doing ridiculous things that are holding us back. If we'll put our eyes on God, then all of a sudden, God's strength, God's ability, it begins to come to us. It takes us forward. And it says, so I won't trip over my own feet. We need focused eyes, but we also need focused feet. And that's the next point is that we need to have focused feet in our life. Second Corinthians chapter 5, 7 says, for we walk by faith not by sight, living our lives in a manner consistent with our confident belief in God's promises. A lot of times people aren't living consistent with their belief system. We know what God says, but, but, but we're, we're not consistent. We're living it. We're walking a different direction. We got to have our feet focused. I, I want to walk in consistency with what the word of God says. We, that doesn't mean we, we don't make mistakes. We make mistakes and we get back up and we, we walk in consistency with what the Bible says about us. What the Bible says about our relationships. What the Bible says about our careers. What the Bible says about our finances. What the Bible says about our health. We got to walk consistently with what the word of God says. And it says we walk by faith, not by sight. Living in a manner consistent with our confident belief in God's promises. You know, walking by faith doesn't mean God's going to give me everything I want exactly when I want it. How many have found that out? <laughs> you know, it's like, I walk by faith. So I'm going to ask God, and God's just going to give it to me. God is not a genie coming out of a bottle to grant your wishes. God is a good father. And a good parent never gives their child everything they want whenever they want it. That's a lazy parent right there. Just, just shut them up. Give it to them. Whatever. That's not good parenting. A good parent will never give their child everything they want exactly when they want it. Why? Because they know it's not good for them. They know it's not going to take them forward. A good parent will actually teach their child how to work hard, how to be organized, how to not give up, how to forgive how to love, how to manage, how to build their character, how to take care of their body, eat healthy, exercise, how to be patient, how to walk in honor and respect, how to be thankful and express gratitude. You see parents say to their child, oh, go back and say thank you. Go back and say, why? Because a good parent is teaching their child how to express thankfulness and gratitude. A good parent teaches their child how to get rid of selfishness. A good parent teaches their child how to think about the feelings of somebody else that they begin to realize you're not the only person in the world. Other people have feelings. Come on, look at the person beside you and say, I have feelings too. Come on, let's be honest. I got feelings too. A good parent will do that. A good parent will teach their child how to grow, develop their gifts, how to be generous, to be a contributor, not a taker. That's what a good parent does. So how much more if God is a good father? Walking by faith does not mean the genie comes out of the Bible. Your wish, give me your three wishes. No, 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 no. Walking by faith means that we trust the good father. We trust the good father to develop us, to lead us to take us forward, to, to, to do the good work on the inside of us, on our character. Walking by faith is I trust I have a good, good father who loves me, who knows my purpose, who knows my future, and he's taking me forward. Psalm 18 verse 36 says, you taught me how to walk with care so my feet will not slip. We trust the good father to teach us how to walk with care. We got focused feet to, to begin to move forward. We trust the good father to teach us how to walk with care so my feet don't slip and make a mess of things. And the last one today, what develops your focus for the journey is having a focused posture. I don't know about you, but sometimes people will help you correct your posture. Anybody had that happen? Or they're like, you know, especially if you work and you, you know, have an office job and you kind of slouch and you don't have good posture. Or, you know, sometimes people don't have good posture when they walk, when they sit, right? And if you don't correct your posture, what happens? You got a sore neck, sore back. I mean, there's a whole lot of sore going on, right? You know, and you're like, I don't know what's wrong with me. And a correction in your posture 
actually can get rid of a lot of, of pain that you experience in your body. And so it's incredible. But I don't want to talk about a natural posture. I want to talk about your spiritual posture. If we have a focused posture in our life, it allows us to be able to see clearly. It allows us to be able to have focused feet, focused eyes, focus in the other area of our life because our posture is in the right position. And Psalm 25, verse 14 to 15 says, Only those who stand in awe of the eternal will have intimacy with him. Standing in awe of God is the right posture where we look up, God, I'm in awe. You are the creator of everything. You know everything. And you are everywhere at the same time. I stand in awe of you. When we have that right focus posture in our life, it empowers us to see clearly so we can go on the journey, take steps forward. Only those who stand in awe of the eternal will have intimacy with him, and he will reveal his covenant to them. Perpetually, my focus takes me to the eternal because he will set me free from the traps laid for me. It says on and on perpetually, my focus keeps taking me back to the eternal. When we have the right posture, God, I'm in awe of you. God, I, I, I reverence you. I respect you. I honor you. When we have that right posture, we can see clearly. And it says that focus just keeps taking us back to Jesus. So something goes on on Monday and it's a bit of a distraction, but that focus, it just takes you back to Jesus again. And you get a phone call and it's not the phone call you were hoping for. But all of a sudden, that posture, that focus takes you back to Jesus, the one who has the answer, the one who knows you, the one who knows the beginning from the end, the one who has all the wisdom that we need. It says, perpetually, my focus takes me to the eternal because he will set me free from the traps laid for me. John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There is a real enemy who tries to trip you up, lay some traps for you steal from you, destroy you, distract you, take you on the detour so that you're not, un, you're not receiving and living in this goodness of God. You're not stepping forward through an open door. You feel like there's a brick wall in front of you. And, and, and so what happens is when we have our right posture, we're looking at God, we allow our eyes to have that posture. God, I'm in awe of you, I'm in awe of you, I'm in awe of you. It says that that focus allows us to move forward. And those things that were going to trap us, those traps that were laid in front of us, we can see clearly. And we're not trapped up by the traps of the enemy. Why? Because of the right focused posture. You know, Pastor Steve is encouraging you to be part of the worship night. And you say, well, I don't like music. I don't really like singing. You don't have to like music or singing to come to a worship night. It's all about posture. It's all about coming in. You don't got to, if you don't want to sing, don't sing. You don't want to dance, don't dance. You don't want to clap your hands, don't clap your hands. Whatever. Posture. Lift, you up, lift your head up to have the right posture. God, I'm in awe of you. Begin to remember you are all knowing, all powerful. You are the one who can heal the sick. You are the one who can mend the brokenhearted. You are the one who can make a way where there is no way. You are the one who can restore relationships. You are the one who gives creative ideas. You are the one. I am in awe of you. And when your posture is right, then you can move forward through the open door. That's what worship does. Is it allows us to get the correct posture. Do you know the correct posture of worship? will take a lot of pain out of your life. Sore neck, sore back, you know, whatever it is in the natural. What about sore heart, bitterness, confusion, lack of hope, lack of direction, a, a spin in your tail running around trying to figure out how you're going to do it by yourself. Worship allows you to have the right posture. Takes the pain out so you can focus and go back into receiving Receive the goodness of God. 
receive the plan of God. Receive the strength of God. I believe we could do that together right now, can't we? Close your eyes for a moment. And I want us to just go into receiving mode. I'm going to pray a prayer with you today, and I encourage you to repeat the words after me. Pray it nice and loud, nice and bold, so the person sitting beside you doesn't feel like their voice is the only one they're hearing. We're going to simply correct our posture in the realm of the spirit. We're going to look to God. We're going to say, God, I want you as the leader of my life. We're going to do it together. And as we do that, we're just going to welcome the strength, the goodness, the wisdom of God to come, to flood us, to flow into us, to empower us for this week. And so I encourage everyone to repeat these words after me today and say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Today, I stand in awe of all that you've done and all that you're doing in my life. I choose you as the leader in my life. Right now, I receive from you strength healing wisdom understanding supernatural ability to step forward in jesus name in jesus name i'm going to pray over you now father today every person in this room that their heart is responding i need focused eyes focused feet Whatever the area is in their life, they're like, I, I need this focus. I need this fresh focus in my life. Holy Spirit, I thank you right now in your presence. As we've taken the time to just stand in awe, to worship you, God, your presence has come in to make a way today. We're not waiting for another day. It's here today for us. I got to thank you today that your spirit is doing a good work on the inside of I thank you that he has begun a good work. You are doing it, God. You're going to bring it through to completion. God, I thank you there's a, a refocus happening inside of us, God, that's going to take us forward. And Holy Spirit, I thank you for that strength and ability. You need, you need the strength. You say, I need some fresh strength. I, I'm powered out. Lift your hands right now. Holy Spirit, I thank you right now. There's a fresh strength right now. It's being downloaded, not your ability, not your strength, but his strength, his strength, his strength, his strength. God, I thank you. We receive it right now for God is my helper and he's helping us right now. We thank you for it in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. God bless you today. What a great message from Pastor Steve and Pastor Carmen. We are entering into God's best for our lives. We are online every Sunday at 11 a.m., 12.30 p.m., 2 p.m., and 4 p.m., or here live in the building at Great Church every Sunday at 9.30 a.m., 11 a.m. We also have small groups every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Feel free. Invite your friends and family. We'll have a great experience. If this is your first time here at Great Church, Feel free, visit the welcome table at the back for your free gift. We'll see you guys next week.